This is lecture number three in this SNOT course. I'm going to begin by reminding you about the book by Romilly Allen and its method for producing Celtic knot designs by smoothing the crossing uh, one way or another, uh, written around 1900. Uh, and um, let me show you the operation of the program and also um, a URL for it, uh, just a moment. Let me see, I have the URL on this next slide. There it is. So when you download the slideshow, you will be able to get the URL or you can copy it right there if you care to play with this program. It's amusing to play with this program in the light of thinking about the temporary of EB algebra. Here's the program operating on the website. Um, you just walk up to any crossing and hit it and it will smooth it one way and you hit it again and it smooths it the other way. As you see, when you hit it the first time, it smooths it in the B way and then it smooths it in the A way um, in this lattice. So you can walk around and just uh, randomly uh, change some things and you may get something that you find to be interesting in the course of your doodling, uh, this kind of doodling. Um, and uh, just to show you that you can get some very nice Celtic knot designs out of it. Here's the demo in the program, which uh, has some crossing smoothings, making it into a nice classical Celtic knot pattern. So uh, I recommend this. And you can also, of course, if you wish, um, do some temporally lead kind of experiments with it by setting yourself up some uh, nearly parallel lines like this, and then examining what kind of uh, temporal Lieb algebra smoothings might be available to you in the course of this. So I'm just doing a little experiment myself here. I'm going to get a turnaround at the end. I'm getting a certain closure, but if I do this and I do that, and then I do that, and then I do that, I'm getting some uh, products and elements in the temporally Lieb algebra, and I can fool around uh, using this program to look for patterns. So uh, I wanted to mention that. I thought you might find it interesting to look at. So there it is again, the URL for Andrew Burrell's program. Now let's uh, move forward and I'm going to flip through some slides. In fact, maybe it's better to just jump to where we were talking about temporally Lieb algebra and continue talking about this. So here are the diagrammatic temporally Lieb generators. We have the U1 through the UN minus one and we have uh, a loop, and of course we have the identity consisting of n parallel lines. In this case, I've indicated um, an arbitrary n, and I've also illustrated some three-stranded ones. The, these generators satisfy the relations ui squared is delta ui, and as illustrated, ui, ui plus one ui is equal to ui, and the ui and the uj commute if the difference in the index is greater than one. The index, of course, represents the left strand in the pair of strands that are involved in the turnaround. Uh, and this, is, this could be regarded just as a convenient diagrammatic for an algebra, which is defined in this way. But I want to indicate to you that um, the algebra actually is describing the connection structure that we're looking at when we use um, diagrams of this kind. So uh, if you well, look at this, you'll see the basic, uh, one basic way to go back and forth. 
Uh, here I've indicated the connection structure on the right, and I've drawn it in a completely rectilinear and simplified fashion. One is connected to six at the top, nine is connected to seven prime at the bottom, and so on. Um, the numbers uh, in, in, that are on the diagram itself are indicating the column where something occurs. So between three and four is column three between two and three is column two, and so on. And they also indicate how to pair um, an upper edge to a lower edge to form the turnaround pair that is a temporary leave element. So if you make a drawing of this kind, rectilinear, and um, all connections from top to bottom will go straight down, straight to the left, and straight down, or straight down, straight to the right, and straight down. All connections from top to top go straight down, horizontal, and straight back up. All connections to the bottom go straight up, straight across, straight down. You get a minimal diagram of this kind. You then, in the columns, in between the labeled numbers on the lines, you can label pairings and you just alternately label the pairings. It's completely determined. And then you can read off a temporally lead product, which will be the same connection structure as the one you started with. So in this case, this is U3, U2, U1, the diagonal sequence near the top of the diagram, then U4, U3, then U5, U4, um, and then U6, U7, U8. Um, and this gives you a canonical product in the temporary leave algebra that is associated to any given connection structure. And then what you can prove, if you do a little more work, is that if you allow the moves, think of these as topological moves that these uh, 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 algebra relations correspond to, particularly the UI, UI plus one UI is a basic topological move, but so is the commuting. And of course the UI squared is a combinatory move. It lets a loop out. Um, if, you, if, you allow, if you think of these as topological moves and you take any other representation of the connection structure by pairing uh, maxima and minima, then you can by a series of algebraic moves like Reitermeister moves, get to a minimal structure, and the minimal structure is unique. And so that means that if you have a given connection structure and you have two representations of it in the temporary Lieb algebra form, those two temporary Lieb representations of it will be algebraically equivalent because each can be reduced to the canonical form that is associated with that connection structure. So this means that the temporary Lieb algebra actually, uh, actually describes precisely the connection structures under multiplication, as we've indicated, by putting lower lines, lower ends to upper ends and connecting them, multiplying like braids. So uh, I won't read uh, this text, but this describes what I was saying a little bit. And you can look at it if you're taking on the slideshow. But here are some examples that are amusing to look at. Here, for example, I have started with a given connection structure on the left. I've written it in the rectilinear form. I've made the associations. And I've written it as a canonical product. The canonical products, of course, are determined a little bit up to some commuting and so on if things do commute. Um, Here's another phenomenon that's interesting. Here's C uh, over here, uh, a, a little connection structure. We aren't worrying about what its algebraic form is, but in fact, the algebraic form is U1, U2, because you can take that line down the middle and bump one part up and the other part down to get a, a maximum and a minimum, and it will look like U1, U2. Um, but if you take C and you square it, why then you get a maximum and minimum canceling in the middle and it gets back to C. So you see immediately visually in terms of the connection structure that C squared is equal to C. On the other hand, in the algebra, C is C, U1, U2. And if you multiply U1, U2 by U1, U2, 
then you see you get a U2, U1, U2, which in the algebra is just U2, and we're back to C. But this is an interesting phenomenon. Um, what other kinds of elements could we make that have square equal to themselves? Here's an example. I have a P here, and uh, I can think of it as factored into alpha and beta, which are not actually elements in the temporally Lieb algebra. They're elements in a generalization of the temporally Lieb algebra, where we have some number of points at the top and some other number of points at the bottom. And again, the connection structure is planar. And we can multiply them if they have the corresponding points. So you can think of this as like matrix algebra, where matrices of size 2 by 3 can be multiplied by matrices of size 3 by 5, and so on. Or you can um, speak in a fancier way and say that this is a category rather than an algebra. And we're looking at the temporally Lieb category. However, you care to think about it, notice that if you multiply alpha and beta uh, in the other order, why then there's a little wiggle that goes away. And consequently, if you were to square P, the wiggle will occur in the middle, and the wiggle looks like an identity, and consequently, you'll get alpha beta back. So at the level of connection structures, it's quite clear that P squared is equal to P. On the other hand, uh, what if you make one of these and uh, look at it algebraically? Then you have um, some more complex combinatorics happening. Uh, here I made one with this wiggle, as you see, and I cut it uh, apart and, and took the product in the other order, and I have a temporally Lieb element P here, and I've used the canonical form to write out a product for it. U3, U2, U1, U4, U3, U2, U5, U6. And um, you can enjoy yourself taking the algebra way to show that P squared is equal to P. We designed it so that P squared is equal to P, and it will go by the relations. Um, and this leads to a nice problem. Can you characterize algebraically uh, those elements in the multiplicative temporally Lieb algebra whose square is equal to themselves. You can see how to do the underlying combinatorics, but the underlying combinatorics leads you to um, curves which are drawn in the plane and then bisected by a horizontal line in, and so more complicated than just a curve. And those are uh, a version of what combinatorialists call meanders. Meanders are you, uh, these are meanders of the, in the form of one one tangles. They start with a line, they end with a line, and, and they meander in the middle back and forth across a horizontal line. Um, uh, of course, you can have multiple meandering as well, like this guy here, Q. Q squared is equal to Q again for the same reasons. But um, as you see, the identity that happens in the middle is uh, a two-strand identity in the very middle. Uh, and um, again, you can uh, write it down as products of temporally Lieb generators and think about it that way. The classical meanders are like this. You draw a Jordan curve in the plane and you bisect it with a line. And then you wish to classify all of them up to isotopy in the plane. And you can look up the literature and you'll find that there's quite a lot of interesting enumeration and algebra associated with the study of classical meanders. And as you see, classical meanders correspond to elements in temporally Lieb whose square is equal to a single loop times r. r squared is delta r. Because if you take the r that I obtained by cutting it and putting the ordered product in the other direction, you multiply r by itself, it fits those two together in the middle, giving back the meander, but the binding line has been removed and you just get a single curve pulling out. So r squared is delta r. And if you were to continue the, your exercise here, you can write r as a certain product of um, temporally Lieb generators by using the canonical form. And then you will have an, an interesting and complex example of, of an R in the algebra whose square is equal to a multiple of it by the loop. Um, characterize those algebraically. Um, it's a challenging problem. 
um, and it may be worthwhile to think about it in terms of whatever theory of meanders you have found. So those are some combinatorial remarks about the temporally lieb algebra and the connection structure. Another combinatorial remark that I want to make is that you can take an element of the combinatorial temporally lieb algebra, the connection structure, connections between bottom row and top row and between themselves, and you can take the top points and bend them down to the bottom, and then you have a connection between two end points to itself, um, and it's a parenthesis structure now. Uh, and you have an even number of points and they and you have uh, pairings between them, which are nested. Um, and you see that counting or looking at temporally Lieb algebra is really the same as studying parentheses, studying all the different forms of parentheses. I may come back to this later. Um, it's quite interesting to think about the structure of these as parentheses. And it's one of the many combinatorial reformulations of a counting problem called the Catalan numbers, which comes up. The number of different parenthesis structures is the same as the number of element, uh, generating elements in temporally lieb. And that number for n strand temporally lieb is one over n plus one choose two n n. And that's the nth Catalan number. The numbers go 1, 3, 5, 14, and so on. Uh, lots of interesting things there. I mentioned this slide before, and I'm going to leave it be and perhaps come back to the notion of Dirac brackets later on. I want to now talk about knots in statistical mechanics, and in particular, the POTS model and how it's related to the bracket state sum. So the framework that we're going to use here consists in a lattice G, a graph G, and I'll let it be planar for the time being. That's where it interfaces as, at best with the bracket. We'll be able to come back to this matter a little later uh, when we've talked about virtual knots, and generalize some of the things that I say to non-planar graphs, which is of interest in terms of statistical mechanics. Um, the states of the physical system associated with G consist in assignments of, let's call them spins or colors, to the vertices of the graph. The spins are assumed to be available in Q different discrete values, four maybe, or two, or 217 where Q is a positive integer. And thus we take the neutral term color in place of spin and consider a state to be an assignment of colors to the vertices of G. Uh, and of course, it's not necessarily a proper coloring. Two vertices, two nodes that are connected by an edge might well have the same color. They might have an al aligned spins. The colors may correspond to spins of particles located at the vertices or with any other localizable and discrete physical states. So uh, the hint from the physics for thinking about this is, <coughs> is the notion of partition function. And part of this goes back to Boltzmann, who would uh, consider the probability of a state in a given system to be proportional to e to the minus one over a certain constant times the temperature multiplied by the energy of the state. So the higher the energy of the state, the lower is its probability here if k is positive, which it will be in this form. Um, the temperature on the other hand uh, going up also uh, affects the probability. And given that the probability is proportional to this exponential, you can say that the probability of the of a given energy state uh, is going to be equal to e to the minus one over kte divided by the total sum of the partition function or the probability of a given state depending on how you care to look at that. Um, 
So this means that you can deduce various quantities from the partition function or in relation to it. And in particular, what is interesting from the point of view of the physics when you think about a partition function is does the system have a change in its physics, uh, a particular kind of change when you cross certain temperatures? We know that when you cross a certain temperature, water will go from ice to liquid or from liquid to gas. Phase transitions of physical systems are related to the properties of the, the states that they can have and the energies that they can have. And so it was um, a very wonderful conjecture by some people uh, a while back that perhaps you would see physical properties of, um, of that kind, phase transition, in, in very simple models of this sort of situation. And that is what was proved by Ansager in the middle 1940s when he showed that a certain two-state system on a graph where the graph is a rectangular lattice and you look at the limit of the situation when the number of points in the lattice goes to infinity does have phase transition. That gave rise to the whole study of combinatorial or so-called exactly solvable uh, statistical mechanics models. And you can find a lot of information about that in the book by Baxter, by Rodney Baxter, called Exactly Solvable Models in Statistical Mechanics. So, so we have this interest in examining the properties of this sum over all the states, um, e to the minus one over kt times the energy of the state. And what is the simple uh, example uh, that um, can be studied? Well, here it is. This is very graph theoretic. You have a graph and you have assignments of colors to the nodes of the graph. And then given two nodes, which are connected by an edge, I say that the, uh, that, that cont will contribute to the energy if they are aligned, if they have the same color the more coincidences, the higher the energy. And that is this energy functional that you see here. You may as well take epsilon to be equal to one. One can consider the two cases. Um, so then the energy is simply bigger, the more coincidences there are. And E is the count of the coincidences. Delta of sigma i sigma j is the Kronecker delta. So delta is equal to one when sigma i equals sigma j and zero otherwise. Um, in the case q equal to two, with only two possible assignments at each node, that's the Ising model. Not always written that way, but it is the Ising model. The Ising model is sometimes written with assignments of minus one and plus one. You can take a look at this in the literature. And that's the one that Baxter solved. And you may also be interested, I think in the next iteration of slides, I'll put some references for you. Uh, it's very interesting to look at how one can solve the Ising model. Um, you will find that Baxter basically uses analysis and operator algebras. It's very intricate. Um, later, people use more combinatorics. There's a good account of a combinatorial proof in Feynman's book on statistical mechanics, all worth looking at. Temperley, around 1970, I should look up the exact date, realized that the Potts model, as we've described it, is directly related to the graph theoretic dichromatic polynomial. Um, the dichromatic polynomial is a graph polynomial defined in two variables, q and v here. And uh, we'll call the evaluation of it z because it will turn out to be a partition function. Um, and z has a recursive formula. If you have an edge in the graph, you can delete it, as I've indicated in the first part of the formula on this slide, or you can contract it to a point. Um, and the formula is that z of the graph with an edge can be re replaced by z of the graph with the edge deleted, 
plus V times Z of the graph with the edge contracted to a point. And then if there's an extra vertex in the graph unconnected to everyone else, then the partition function, the dichromatic polynomial is multiplied by Q. Now you'll notice that certainly the second one is exactly what would happen in the partition function because there are Q different states for that point. Um, on the other hand, we have to find out what V would be appropriate for turning this into a Boltzmann type partition function. We'll get to that. Here's an example of computing the graph polynomial. I have one edge and I delete it and I get two points or I contract it and I get one point. Now the Z with the two points uh, with no edge between them is Q squared. And the Z with one point is Q and so I get Q squared plus VQ for that one. If I have a loop, then I can remove it, but I can also contract it and I get a point in both cases. So I get Q times one plus V for Z of a loop. Uh, a further remark about the dichromatic is that if you took v equal to minus one, then you would be counting the number of colorings of the graph with q colors so that if two edges, two points, excuse me, if two nodes were connected by an edge, then they would be colored differently. The number of proper colorings of the graph. So if q is four, uh, then Z, G will be equal to the number of four colorings of the nodes of the graph. And if G is planar, then you would be looking at the four color problem for the planar graph. Now, this is the case of zero energy in our kind of modeling, because remember, higher energy involves lots of more coincidences. So there are no, when there are no coincidences, you're, do, you're looking at the coloring problem. Dichromate, is due to Tut, William Tut. The original chromatic polynomial is due to Hassler-Whitney. And it is interesting to contemplate that Hassler-Whitney at the time when he developed the chromatic polynomial was probably uh, within a few blocks of J.W. Alexander. Uh, but uh, maybe they didn't compare notes. So here's the proposition of temperly. If you have a planar graph and you have the partition function of the Q state Ponce model, and you let V be equal to, remember epsilon is one, V is equal to E to the minus one over KT minus one. That's the physical parameter for the V. And you see that when the temperature is high, uh, but non-zero, then it won't just be minus one. Then Z is equal to the partition function for the POTS model. So that's a wonderful observation of temporally that the POTS model is exactly this graph polynomial. Uh, I won't bother you with the proof in the formal sense of looking at this, but I think I would like to go back to the recursion formula and ask you to think about what's involved here. You see, it might be that you have the same spin on those two nodes that are connected by an edge. If you did, the partition function wants to put in an e to the minus one over kt, right? And over here on the right, the left-hand one doesn't seem to want to put in anything but a one, but the right one wants to put in a v. And you do get both terms because since they were colored the same, when you contract it, you will have a color on that node. So one of them wants to put in the V and the other one wants to put in a one. And you should have one plus V is equal to E to the minus one over KT, which is what is desired. And that's what I just said, that V is equal to E to the minus one over KT minus one. One plus V equals E to the minus one over KT. So actually, that's most of the reasoning that shows you what needs to be done. Your, what needed to be done on Temperley's side was to suspect that deletion contraction was the right way to go. And he saw that. Uh, 
we would like to translate this into a bracket. And there is a, a way to go from deletion and contraction over to the bracket. It's very simple. If you have a graph, you can form a new graph. If you have a graph in the plane, you can form a four regular graph, uh, a projection of a knot, by putting a little x uh, at every crossing and then connecting up the lines around the regions, which I have indicated here. Um, and by doing that, you then translate deletion and contraction into smoothing one way and smoothing the other way. And of course, you're dealing with shaded knot diagrams now. So you get Z of a shaded knot diagram with a crossing in it is equal to Z of one smoothing plus VZ of the other smoothing, a bracket expansion on shaded knot diagrams. That's what I mean when I said I presume that Alexander and uh, Astler Whitney were perhaps not talking to each other about what they were doing. But then you can translate it further so that it works in the counts that we make, which are counts of boundary circles rather than numbers of shaded components. And the formula undergoes a change, which I will not suffer you to go through a proof of here, but you may be interested in it, and I can give you a reference of mine. But the uh, way it works is that you multiply the v by q to the minus one half, and you take the value of the loop to be q to the one half. And then you multiply the entire bracket that you have now defined by q to the n over two, where n is the number of nodes in the graph, and you get the partition function. So this means that the partition function uh, of the POTS model can be written quite directly in terms of a bracket evaluation of what turns out to be an alternating knot associated with the graph. Maybe I have an example. Here's an example. Um, in this example, I have a very simple graph, the same line graph we had before, and it, there's a little figure eight loop uh, that it corresponds to by using the medial construction. Um, and then you see that according to my curly bracket, I get q to the minus one half v times one loop plus two loops, which gives me q to the minus one half v times a q to the one half, and the two loops give me a q, and then that turns into q v plus q, and then I multiply by q to the n over two, which is another q, and we get q v plus q squared, and there is the same as the dichromatic. So another way of uh, understanding the theorem I just stated is that this is a way to compute the dichromatic polynomial of a plane graph in terms of the bracket formalism. And you will notice that it, that means that if you had rewritten your graph so that when you took it over to an alternating knot like this by the medial, um, uh, you could uh, see a braid in there then you could expand the braid into the temper of the v algebra, and you would have written the Potts model or the dichromatic polynomial in terms of the temper of the v algebra. This also corresponds to the structure of work that Temperley and Lieb did, where uh, they discovered that they could write the Potts model in terms of temper of the algebra, but they were doing it by finding matrices involving the transfer functions in the statistical mechanics model that had the relations of the temporally v algebra. They were not looking at it the same way we're looking at it here. So this is a picture of this uh, form of translation. You can start with the graph. You can form the medial by putting an x on each edge. You can put a standardized crossing at every edge so that the edge goes through in the A way, let's say, and then you get an alternating knot. And the alternating knot, if you started with a rectangular lattice, could be regarded as a braid that has been 
closed at the bottom by minima and closed at the top by minima. That's called a plat closure of the braid. And the braid in between is a braid that could be expanded into the POTS model, uh, into the temporary leave algebra, excuse me. And so we would find that the POTS model for G could be written expandedly into the temporary leave algebra by way of that braid. Quite interesting to look at this. And maybe it's worth looking at it again to try to show the phase transition in the general POTS model for arbitrary Q, which has not been proved yet. It's well known for Q equals two and possibly for some other values and special geometries. So we contemplate alternating weaves like this and see them as corresponding to statistical mechanics models. Um, another relationship with elementary physics is the relationship uh, between the graphical expression of the Rademeister moves and electricity. And so I've indicated this here. This is a uh, the relationship with electricity is a discovery of mine and Jay Goldman, and we had some papers on this. Um, the observation of how to translate the Reitermeister moves into moves on graphs goes way back, probably to Reitermeister's time. I should check the references for you. Um, but you see that if we call um, the edge of the graph going through the crossing along the A way of splitting it, a plus, and going through the crossing in the B way, a minus, then uh, when you draw the checkerboard graph, which puts one node for every shaded region and one edge for every crossing common to two regions, then the little curl in the first Reitermeister move becomes a pendant edge, or it becomes a pendant loop, depending on how the shading works. If the shading is interior, becomes a pendant edge. Exterior becomes a pendant loop. And those can be removed by the first Reitermeister move. So you can remove pendant edges or pendant loops signed with plus or minus one. Um, if you look at the second Reitermeister move, you see that uh, in one form of shading it, you get a plus and a minus in parallel. In the other form of shading it, you get a plus and a minus in series. And now think about electrical conductance. If you have two conductors in parallel, then you add their conductance because you can go along one pathway or you can go along the other pathway. So the total conductance increases as you add more in parallel. So the conductance here being plus in one and minus in the other goes to zero if they're in parallel. If they're in series, um, it's the same as having no resistance at all, infinite conductance. And I should have written the rule down on the slide, but I'm going to remind it uh, to you verbally. And when I make the slideshow, uh, again, before I put it on the Dropbox, I will fix this and put the formula in. But the formula for A and B in parallel is A plus B. The formula for A and B in series is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of A and B. So try that out. Uh, if you had for example, a conductance of one on two lines in series, then the conductance of the series connection of them would be one divided by one over one plus one over one, which is one over two. The conductance is going down. That makes sense because you see there's a certain uh, attenuation due to the first conductance, and then it has to go through the second one and it attenuates again. So. That's the rule. The rule is um, a, a generalization of the Boolean algebra rules where 
reciprocal looks like negation. And the reciprocal of the sum of reciprocals being equal to another operation is like De Morgan's law, which says that the and A and B is the negation of the negation of A or the negation of B, if you like these correspondences. In any case, this is the electrical rule if you allow negative conductance. Negative conductance is amplification. Positive conductance is a kind of resistance. You have to, um, resistance is easy to think of physically. Amplification, a little more complicated, but formally we can work with it. It is the, in, it is the electrical rule. And here is the star triangle relation for the third Reinemeister move. One graph has a star form, the other has a small triangle form. The edges uh, that go into the star can be thought of as corresponding to the edges around the triangle. Each edge goes to its negative. The edge, the plus edge, uh, goes to an edge that uh, is opposite it and has the opposite sign. Um, this, there is a more general electrical star triangle rule. And uh, one of the more interesting points about the star triangle rule is that it was discovered by an engineer whose name is Star. Uh, in and back in the 1800s. So these are, in fact, correct electrical transformations. And that means that you can get some knot invariance by measuring the conductance between two points on the checkerboard graph. I could come back to that and tell you more, but I thought I would just give you the hint. Um, now, the Bracket polynomial can be regarded as a combinatorial topological analog of a statistical mechanics summation. And you may wish to then say, uh, well, what about this temperature and everything? Uh, what will happen with it? Um, could we uh, think really think of it as a, a statistical mechanics sum? And you will find, if you do the analysis, that the topological place where the bracket is working corresponds to imaginary temperature in the Boltzmann statistical mechanics domain. That's suggestive of relationship with quantum mechanics, but we'll go into that later. The, the analogy is nevertheless worth thinking about. Uh, and perhaps there is an appropriate mathematical notion of phase transition that would work for knots as well. Or perhaps looking at things in terms of knots would help to understand why we get phase transition in some of the statistical mechanics models. There's lots to investigate still in this domain. The next thing uh, that I'm going to talk about is Morse diagrams and quantum link invariants. And in the last talk, I actually quickly went through this, but I think that this talk has done enough for one talk. And so I will stop here. And when I give the next talk, we will start at the point of Morse diagrams and quantum link invariants. So this completes our discussion for today. And I will stop and look forward to seeing you soon.